modern science, medicine, political freedom, the market economy. All of them, we're told, are the result of a sort of miracle that took place 250 years ago. That miracle is called the Enlightenment. All right. <laughs> miracle. <laughs> you didn't even make it to 30 seconds. No, I can't. <laughs> this is how it's going to be, guys. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, I think Pinker uses the term miracle in, uh, in a lot of what we're going to hear today is kind of a response to Pinker's Enlightenment Now uh, book. Uh, but Pinker doesn't take miracle seriously, as Hazoni tries to imply in this as kind of coming out of nowhere. Uh, Pinker does give the historical context for this, but nobody actually believes that the Enlightenment is just boom. Yeah, I mean, he goes on in this video, uh, the miracle of calling the Enlightenment a moment in history, as though it's, again, just this one split second 30 years ago or a couple of years and that's a straw man who argues for that i mean if you go back to actual enlightenment thinkers people like d'alembert the encyclopedists they're very historical they're seeing this as a progression that's been developing bacon was a progenitor of it and the people before that and they all see this as something a light that's been dawning over civilization for hundreds of years and they see themselves as at a kind of cresting uh time in it but not, you know, it came out of the blue. And he's going to go on in a, a few seconds to quote Pinker. And the quote is going to be, progress is the gift of the ideals of the Enlightenment. And that's not the same thing as calling it a miracle, that it's a gift of the ideals that were embraced. It doesn't mean those ideals don't have any precursors, but that the Enlightenment's a period when the ideals of reason and political freedom are embraced. And it's that those two things above all else that produces the progress that we all enjoy today, that is a gift of those thinkers who champion those ideals. So it, it's not putting in the category of what he quotes. And there's a lot of that, like there's no evidence for a lot of the things that he presents. And this is, there's no reason to think it's a miracle that, that, that that's what Pinker's arguing. No, and I've read Pinker's book. He talks about, he talks about the development of, of secular humanism in the Renaissance. And he talks about, the importance of scientific revolution to the Enlightenment, how it couldn't have come about without the scientific revolution. And so, I, you know, I don't know that Pinker does complete justice to the precursors of the Enlightenment. He probably doesn't. That's not his job. That's not what he's trying to do in the book. But he certainly doesn't view it as coming out of nowhere as this. this uh... Now, he does view it, and there's a sense in which it's a miracle. I mean, not really, but there's a sense in which, wow. I mean, all these amazing thinkers all at once doing this amazing work, coming up with these amazing ideas and look at the consequences. That sense of wonder, I think, is what Pinker would use the word miracle for, is, is, is in wonder of, wow, isn't this amazing, rather than as unexplained coming out of nowhere uh, uh, starting point. This is fantastic kind of synergy of that happens when good ideas catch on, right? Or even partial good ideas catch on. And that's what we're all trying to make there be more of in the world. And from that perspective, it really is. So you can use miracle in that sense that it's wondrous, but not inexplicable. And I mean, what we're doing now, the three of us talking in different geographical locations and watching a fourth video from someone, they couldn't have even dreamt that people would be doing this in 200, 300 years. And in that sense, it is miraculous. Yeah, yeah. And, and streaming it on three different platforms. Yeah. And get Getting live comments from people, it truly is amazing. All right, let's, I'll try to hold off on more than, this is 16 seconds and more than 16 seconds. A moment in history when philosophers suddenly overthrew religious dogma and tradition and replaced it with human reason. Harvard professor Steven Pinker puts it this way, progress is a gift of the ideals of the enlightenment. There's just one problem with this claim. It isn't really true. Consider the U.S. Constitution, which is frequently said to be a product of Enlightenment thought. But you only need to read about English common law, which Alexander Hamilton and James Madison certainly did, to see that this isn't so. I mean, this is such a straw man, right? I mean, English common law was already significantly influenced by renaissance and enlightenment thought and maybe we should talk about the a little bit about the origins of the enlightenment and different views of it and, and Rand's view of it 
Um, but there are all kinds of influences on the Constitution that are claimed by different people, some of them plausibly from like certain Iroquois documents that Ben Franklin liked to this in France and that in England and especially the British, the English Constitution. And these things are all real influences. But part of what a philosophy of reason is about is about integrating and finding the best material from different sources, critically evaluating it, thinking of how to put it together uh, and not going by it because it's traditional. And that's this is the idea of reason is overthrowing tradition. It's not saying nothing from the past is any good. It's overthrowing the idea that we should follow it because it's the past, because it's venerable, because it's old. We have to think about it, consider it, keep what's good, get rid of what's bad. And of course, there's good stuff in English common law and lots of other places that they're going to keep or stuff that they think is good. Some of it wasn't, but they thought it was, and some of it was really good. And it's uh, it's way underplaying what the achievement was. So if you say that the Constitution was an achievement of enlightenment thought or the creation, I think better, the creation of the United States of America is the product of the enlightenment. It's the creation of a new country. It's not just thinking, you know, it would be better if we had a government that had a little more checks and balances, not this absolute power. It's And this goes back to Pinker is putting it as an ideal they're thinking of it as this is what we're striving for, and this is what we're going to work in action to create, and having a whole vision for that, and then taking all the steps to create the actual country. That's the achievement, and you don't get that in any other era, and nothing similar to it, that we're going to rethink government from the ground up and create a new government based on these principles that we've articulated. And they never claim we've come up with every principle that's embedded in this but it's rather we've done something that is unprecedented and that they're right. And it's such a breaking with tradition. So the idea that what they're doing is looking back and oh, other people used to do that. So that's what we're gonna do. It's that is not at all a proper view of what the founding fathers of America are doing. Already in the 15th century, the English jurist, John Fortescue elaborated the theory of checks and balances due process, and the role of private property in securing individual freedom and economic prosperity. Similarly, the U.S. Bill of Rights has its sources in English common law of the 1600s. Or consider modern science and medicine. Long before the Enlightenment, tradition-bound English kings sponsored path-breaking scientific institutions, such as the Royal College of Physicians, founded in 1518, and the Royal Society of London, founded in 1660. The truth is that statesmen and philosophers, especially in England and the Netherlands, articulated the principles of free government centuries before America was founded. <laughs> um, I mean, this strikes me as, you know, ahistorical in a sense of a, that they articulated to the extent that a, a Locke and then the founders articulated in, in that kind of integrated way. And B, that it was taken seriously. There's a reason why. I mean, there might have been some scholar a long time ago came up with a good idea and then a culture ignored it. So he's ignoring the culture of the Enlightenment, the, a culture that was created by these thinking, by these thinkers as well. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's, I would put it way stronger than it's ahistorical. It's completely wrong. Um, that so, and no, and there's, I think here you start seeing the slanting. You put it, if you know his views about nationalism, conservatism, religion, you could predict what's going to be in this video. What's absent? I think it's worth thinking about what's absent. There's no mention of Greece or Rome. And I think the basic reason is because we can't ascribe that to Christianity or Judeo-Christian tradition. So I don't want, but if you ask who did the founding fathers study. So they certainly studied the English tradition, English common law. They were experts in knowledge of Rome and Greece and Rome's political history and drawing on that. And that's a far greater achievement than anything in the medieval period, if we're thinking politically. And they knew that, and that was their view. So, to, so and this is the, sense, the issue that obviously this had precursors. The founding fathers were students of history. And they said they took all kinds of lessons from history, positive and negative, but it's fashioning it now into a new ideal of political freedom and of rights that you get really with Locke as articulating it as a full ideal and that government should be based on this. 
And that's what they're trying to put into practice. Um, so it has a history, but it also has many novelties. Um, and that's what the Enlightenment political achievement is. And also, what are we contrasting the Enlightenment with? If we're saying, oh, there was this stuff in 1600, like the Royal Society is the contrast, which is a clear precursor to it. So the, the, the Enlightenment is part of a process, and it's seen by the Enlightenment intellectual, again, by the people who are later in this period and reflecting on what it is. And the, the, the obvious touchstone here is the encyclopedists, and particularly de Lambert, who's writing about how this thing developed. And it, there was a dark ages. There was a period where people were ignorant. They didn't know anything. There had been Rome and Greece and, and a flowering of learning. And all of that was thrown away by um, Hazani's ilk, these religionists, uh, anti-intellectual bastards, right? And then there's a period where this is being rediscovered, and it takes hundreds of years for it to filter out. And and the the, the Enlightenment figures think about this. It, uh, the, the texts were rediscovered. There was the Renaissance. There's a rebirth of knowledge. Uh, there's a period where people are studying up on the classics, but doing so in, in too slavish a way. So there's a, a rebirth of science, but it's a kind of science where we're timidly following Aristotle or Galen and not thinking about uh, you know, how we might differ from them. And then you get figures like Bacon uh, saying, no, we've got a, w the right lesson from the Greeks is to think about their methodology and how do you prove things from the senses? And what is the, the nature and standards of evidence? We need a new organ. And you get a scientific revolution. You get Galileo. You get all of these people. You get the Royal Society is an organ for the kind of transmission of information between these people as part of a process of enlightenment. And although the scientific revolution and Bacon are considered Renaissance thinkers, they're seen as kind of patron saints, so to speak, of this developing movement. Uh, and now you get, after there's a scientific revolution, after there's a Newton, or during the period when Newton's writing, a kind of grasp, now we're really onto something. And you get, in the kind of high enlightenment, the, the 18th century, the idea of this is now catching fire culture-wide. And Le Leonard Peikoff has a really great quote about what's special about the Enlightenment, uh, it's the first time in modern history, modern as opposed to ancient, right? The first time in modern history when an authentic respect for reason became the mark of an entire culture. That's what's special here, but it, it happens as a process, and the Royal Society and some of these other things are part of that process. The contrast is before that process was going, when people were prostrating themselves before God, thinking that reason is the uh, harlot of the senses, which is a actually a Protestant quote, but nevertheless relevant here, um, because we can talk about the role of the Reformation and all this. Um, and, uh, you know, did this kind of anti-reason, anti-man, anti-happiness worldview that had crippled Europe for a thousand millennia, basically. All right. So why give the Enlightenment all the credit? Apparently, because it doesn't look good to admit that the best and most important parts of modernity were given to us by individuals who nearly all held conservative religious and political beliefs. So here's the cash in, right? This is, this is the goal, ultimately, is to bolster the idea that, that all the good stuff ultimately comes from religion and, and, and tradition. And religionists, people who are going to tinker just a little bit on the margins and would never pledge their life, uh, fortune, and sacred honor to the cause of defeating the most powerful government in the world. Yeah. And it, it's, a, it's an example of the of slanting and of weasel kind of formulation. So it's, it gives the Enlightenment all the credit. Everything hinges on the all. That it's it's that's the it goes back to activating the miracle like it came out of the blue and it deserved, there was no precursor to it no history, but if you take seriously that it's coming out of the Renaissance and I think Rand's view which I agree with that the Enlightenment is Aristotelian, so if you think of the great battle in philosophy between Plato and Aristotle, Christianity was when Plato is dominant, and from the Renaissance on, it's Aristotle is coming back on the scene. And even though the, many of the Enlightenment figures, because Aristotle was sort of um, incorporated into the church, saw themselves as rebelling against it, it's in the deepest sense, in their methodology, and in the non-skepticism, that so that you can both use your senses and your mind, and you have to use both if what you really as after is knowledge which is what the Enlightenment is about. That is all Aristotelian. And so the idea that it just 
it's all, um, as he puts it, all the credit belongs to the Enlightenment. That nobody, I think, it, no real student of the Enlightenment thinks that. The claim that all good things come from the Enlightenment is most closely associated with the late 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. For Kant, reason is universal, infallible, and independent of experience. His extraordinarily dogmatic philosophy insisted that there can be only one correct answer to every question in science, morality, and politics, and that to reach the one correct answer, mankind had to free itself from the chains of the past. He almost makes Kant sound good. Yeah, I'm, there is one correct answer to every question in those fields. We don't always know it, but I mean, there are, you know, provisional answers on the way. But what does it mean to say there's not one correct answer to questions in morality or politics or science? Like that there either are or aren't atoms. Which one is it? It is either is or is not a right to enslave people. Which one is it? And that is not a distinctive or radical view of Kant's, that there's one answer. It was, I mean... Did the Christian philosophers not think there was one right answer to things? They thought there was. You just had to destroy your mind or subvert it to get it. And there's such package deals going on. I think the, the looking at the conservative perspective is interesting for what gets packaged together. It's, so it's breaking free of the chains of the past, history, tradition, and experience. They don't belong together into one. So it's not true that they were breaking free of history in the sense of ignoring history. Yep. Um, as we've talked about there, it's incredible study of history to learn positive and negative lessons and not to repeat the negative. And in that sense, there is no worship of tradition. They're interested in history, not traditions. They're, and to learn from history, what you can learn, positive and negative. And an experience is... Um, it, he's going to go on to the view that, I mean, this is part of what, why the Enlightenment is incomplete or it's just a partial success. They have this view of reason that is pulling apart, that it's either you deal with abstract theory concepts and you don't engage in observation, in sensory experience, or you have observation, but you can't have any grand theorizing. And, so and his experience is using that and experience like experience of the past which is why he puts it into the your brain which is itself a package so you can't think with like if these are your categories that you just throw out as though you know what you're talking about you can't think with these now is it even true with regard to Kant that he said all good things came from the enlightenment and that he abandoned he he rejected tradition it's not true that I don't know any time and place he said all good things come from the United. I mean, I don't know every word the guy wrote, but yeah. I can't imagine him saying that. Um, I mean, he was uh, a political, a kind of pretty moderate political liberal of his time. So he was, um, you know, he was in favor of the American, well, it's a little ambiguous his views on the American Revolution, actually, but generally pro. Um, so... But he, he was not a, a kind of, I mean, he was pro the Prussian, you know, state. And he, I mean, he wasn't a, um, a firebrand, burn it all down. Uh, but what he does say in the essay, What is Enlightenment? Uh, is that what enlightenment is about is kind of growing up intellectually. The culture is growing up intellectually. And therefore, standing on its own two feet intellectually, rather than being tradition bound, hide bound, accepting things because they're true, using your own reason. And uh, just, you know, taken out of context, understood that way. That's true, I think. And he can't write about that. His view of what it is to reason for yourself and what yourself is and what reasoning is, uh, is uh, very different from mine and very different from the majority of the Enlightenment figures. Uh, and I think he represents a kind of distorting and perverting of it and uh, 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 carrying on from Rousseau, which we can talk about uh, also, he doesn't think reason's infallible. I don't know where that <laughs> comes from. Um, uh, so. And it's a major, I mean, I think part of the, that we're now, that Kant is the end of the Enlightenment. It's that it's cementing home that reason is independent of experience. And that here means sensory experience, sense yeah. perception. Um, 
<clears throat> and you get the view of it's he's on the one hand supposedly pro science, but science doesn't tell you about true reality. Um, and it's it's the voice of Plato in a different kind of form that I think is coming back with Kant, and it's the end of the Aristotelian dominance in philosophy. One thing that that particularly when, um, I mean, Pinker does this and Dazani starts lining up these figures, these are enlightenment and these are not enlightenment. Uh, one thing that's worth keeping in mind is this isn't a club that people have like cards that they're members of and then it's very clear who's enlightenment and who's counter enlightenment. It's a broad intellectual movement. It's the fact that people are becoming educated and thinking and debating ideas on this implicit premise of the centrality of reason. And there are all sorts of huge disagreements among these people about basically everything and about which ideas are the important ones where there are conflicts and then how to resolve them and whether they can be resolved. So if you're going to talk about enlightenment thought, it's not like there's one philosophy that's the philosophy of the enlightenment. There are debates and then trends and things emphasized among these in, within these debates. What we need today what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to iranbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com you're on book show and um and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going i'm not sure when the next